G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy as we approach the 2024 preseason. How exciting. Only a few weeks away before some competitive football starts to happen. We are in the thick of the preseason, all the players are back. So in today's video, I thought it would be a fun exercise to look through 10 players in the comp that I think need to have a big year. And for differing reasons. Sometimes it's from the club's perspective, sometimes it's from the player's perspective. Players I'd like to see take the next step in 2024. And in this video, like I said, I'm going to go through 10. Before I crack in, if you could do me a favor and consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. I've set an audacious goal of hitting 26,000 subscribers by the end of the month. And I would love your help to do so. So if you are enjoying the content, please consider doing so. But anyway, let's crack in. I've got 10 players here who I think need to have a big season. So the first one I'm going to mention is Gold Coast. Matthew Rao, the number one pick from 2019, of course, who has improved in a fairly acceptably linear fashion. And he is a pretty good player, but I think if you compare what would people were saying about Matthew Rao, particularly after his debut season, he had a few injury issues along the way, certainly some big ones as well. I think in 2019, it was his shoulder. I want to say 2020 might have been a knee injury, like an MCL or something like that. He's had his obstacles. And in 2023, I think we saw a pretty good season from Matthew Rao when you consider it was, was 21 disposals a game, but 7.7 clearances, and he did poll 12 Brownlow votes. So that's a very respectable season. I don't think Matthew Rao is tracking badly at all when you consider he's only played four seasons at the level. But what I would like to see from Matthew Rowell, and ultimately the reason I've included him in this video is because we want to see signs that he is going to become that A-grade extractor who can potentially be that Brownlow medalist that he was once talked about potentially being. What I see with Rowell at the moment is uh, he's a little bit one-dimensional, and I, and I just mean this current point in time. He is very, very inside focused. He is a dominant clearance player. He racks up a lot of tackles. I don't know what his tackles numbers are, but he is very, very good at that specific part of the game, which is interesting because as a young midfielder, it's usually the other way around. Usually you, you don't get good at the contested stuff until you're a little bit more mature, but he is an outlier in that respect. If he could accumulate a little bit more outside ball for a start and just impact for longer periods of games, then I think that is what would take him to the next step. And I think he looms as one of their most important players in reaching that next level because Gold Coast have sort of teased us a little bit with their promise and the potential. But if Raul steps up his game, improves his output by, you know, five uncontested possessions a game, then first of all, that puts him in the Brownlow mix. But it will help him, you know, bridge the gap between Anderson and Miller, who I think are currently better midfielders in that team. If they can become a very well rounded trio with Raul doing the heavy lifting inside, but also getting around the ground, I think he's a hugely important player for Gold Coast to push up the ladder. So I've got Matthew Rao, I'd love to see a big year from him. Staying on the Queensland trend, let's talk about Hugh McCluggage, who is a very good player, you'd have to say, and didn't have a bad season at all. That's not really the pretext of this conversation. In some cases, it will be. With Hugh McCluggage, though, what I would say, say about him is that, you know, over the last two years, he was averaging a bit more 25 disposal kind of areas, sort of around the mark for that All-Australian wing spot, sort of in the squad. A certified gun, absolutely. And like I said, last year wasn't a bad year, but there was a drop in output. He was getting a little bit less of the ball. He didn't make the squad this year. And though Brisbane obviously had their best season as a team, the relative contribution from McCluggage was a little bit lower than in previous seasons. And I think for a few reasons, his form this year will be really important. So first of all, Brisbane obviously need to continue to evolve. They need to unearth that next A grader. Is McCluggage a true A grader at this current point in time? No, but I think he I think he will be. And I think he has the potential to be, obviously. But as Brisbane's team and their midfield sort of age, somebody needs to step up and be the next A grader in that team. McCluggage, I think, is on the precipice, has been for there for a little while now. I'd like to see him really take the next step. And the fact that he's in a contract year, I think, is a factor in this. Only not only for his sake to, to maximize his contract, but we do see a trend where, where high quality players have outstanding seasons in contract years, and that could be the case for McCluggage this year in 2024. So I'd like to see him take the next step this coming season. The next player I want to talk about is Jake Stringer. Now, Jake Stringer has flirted with us over the years with some out-of-the-box fantastic form and then at other times I felt like he has been a little bit lacking so in 2021 he kicked 41 goals from 19 games that's pretty good output you'd be happy with that don't think he's really recaptured that form since in his most recent season he had 17 games with just the 21 goals and in a year where Essendon had a bit of a new look forward line we saw Langford go down there we saw a little bit less of Peter Wright naturally I think they needed more and I think they will continue to need more there has been questions over his fitness his skin folds I don't really have too much insight into that but again, another player who's in a contract year and is also 29. There is some impetus for him personally to play well this year, but also naturally, I think there is a need for him to play well for the sake of the team. And I've said this in a previous video, but I'm kind of intrigued how a trio 
of Wright, Langford, and Stringer could go if they're all fit and healthy by round one of this season. I think there's some nice dynamism to that trio. All three players are separately capable of 50 goal seasons as we've seen over the years. So Stringer having a big year is really important, not only for his sake, but the football teams. Now let's talk about the Western Bulldogs' Aaron Norton, who has famously just signed an eight-year extension. So he's contracted already for 2024. Then there's an eight-year extension until 2032 on top of that. And I think it'd probably be around a million a year. I didn't actually write that part down, but we know Sydney came hard for him. He stayed loyal and good on him for that. Now over the last three seasons, we've seen goal tallies of 47, 51, and 44, which are good and solid but you feel like a player on that amount of money, it's probably time for him to start pushing the envelope in that respect. And I think he is capable of a 65 goal season and being around the mark for the Coleman. Not necessarily winning the Coleman, but being 60 to 65 goals, I think is certainly within his range of potential. Admittedly, he is only 24, but I guess what I'm saying here is I think there is some some now some pressure on Aaron Norton to justify the, the investment that the Western Bulldogs have put on him. They're a club under pressure. They're going to need to try and bounce back into the finals race this year. And Norton wasn't that far off not being their highest goal scorer this year. When you consider Waitman, I think had, you know, missed a fair bit of footy, but was only like six goals behind him or something like that. Aaron Norton is not playing poorly. I'm just saying that there is a little bit of implied pressure on the contract that he just signed and where the Bulldogs are at as a football club, particularly when you add in some of the, you know, tall talent they've got behind him. I, th I think it's time for Aaron Norton to really lift the bar in that sense because you compare it to some other forwards who are of a similar age in the league this year, like Larkey and Oscar Allen both kick more goals, considerably more goals in Larkey's case than Norton did this year. And I think he is capable and it's time to deliver on that promise. Let's talk now about one of the most talented young small forwards in the comp, in my opinion, in Kazaya Pickett. Now, Pickett actually has had a pretty good run of three seasons. He kicked 37 goals from 23 games in 2023, but from what I can tell, had way more tackles this year. So statistically, it was actually a pretty good season from Cosy Pickett. I guess the angle I'm coming at this from is for a start, the Demons probably, you know, on an ongoing basis are going to have question marks in their forward 50. They need solutions to hit the goals. And he probably has stagnated a little bit in terms of how many goals he's kicked per season. And I'm really weighting this against what I believe his potential is. As far as I'm concerned, the mantle of being maybe the, the next best small forward in the competition behind Charlie Cameron is waiting for Cozzy Pickett to take it. And I think Melbourne's got an aging list. The time to strike is now. So I think we'd love to see a 50 goal season from Cozzy Pickett. Just a disclaimer as well. I know somebody will point out Toby Green's kind of a small forward. I think Toby Green's better. I was kind of categorizing him as a medium forward midfielder. It's hard these days with all these different heights. Just to be clear, I don't think Cozzy Pickett is, is struggling as a footballer at all, but I think it would be timely for him to have a career best season this year in front of goal and I think he is well and truly capable of that. Now let's talk about one of my favorite opposition players to watch and certainly from a potential point of view I think he has what it takes to be one of the best midfielders in the comp and that's Luke Davis Uniac. I have talked about him a fair bit on this channel and I will continue to repeat myself but you look at the first couple of rounds of 2023 and I thought shit this guy could win the Brownlow medal this year and for the 14 games he played he polled 13 votes which is a pretty good rate. Doesn't mean he necessarily would have won it. There was a lot of good candidates this year for sure. But he averaged about 28 disposals a game. And in particular, that explosive start. I just think of this guy as being a huge barometer for the North Melbourne Football Club where he, when he's turning it on, North Melbourne are playing well. There is an obvious relationship with how LDU is going individually as a player and how North Melbourne are playing. And at the start of the year, when you had Sheasel out of the box, LDU playing his best football, they look like a different side. So I guess what I'm saying here is it's not that he needs to lift his performance, but what a big year would look like for LDU the U is extrapolating that form and playing 20 plus games in a season because I think that will be central to North Melbourne's hopes and when I say hopes I just mean climbing out of the bottom two where they've been firmly entrenched for the last couple of years but I would love to see it because uh, obviously I like watching him play and second of all I've talked him up this much on the channel that it's about time for him to deliver so I stopped looking crazy. The next one I'm going to highlight is actually Harrison Petty and I probably should have grouped this with Cozzy Pickett but I think Harrison Petty looms as a really important player for Melbourne this year. Obviously a play that explored the possibility of going back to Adelaide. It was reported that he was interested in going to the Crows, playing probably as a key back in that team, I would have thought. But he's stayed with the Melbourne Demons. I think he's contracted for this season and next. And it looks like he is going to be playing more of a forward role in 2024. So we saw him play a little bit there at the back end of last year. He kicked a bag of six against Richmond. I think in his last game, he kicked two against North and then got injured, got subbed out of that game. But we've seen enough to suggest that Melbourne might tinker with this format a little bit further. And that's why I think he's so important because in particular, the Ds are getting a little bit closer to this end of this premiership cycle. Now, that doesn't mean they can't use the right list management move 
move to prolong this premiership cycle. But at the same time, I think the time is of the essence here for the Ds and Harrison Petting emerging as not necessarily a common medalist this year, but if he banks 40 goals from this year, that is an outstanding result. And I think that could change the way the Ds play because you've got some struggling other forwards in this team. I don't know exactly where McDonald, Shackey and Brown all sit, but I'd imagine Petty gets first crack. And I think he looms as an important piece for them in 2024. I'm going to return now to the North Melbourne Footy Club. I have doubled up on teams in this video. Uh, I want to talk about Cam Zerha this time and another player that I think is important to North Melbourne's prospects in 2024. So his output was a little bit down last year. I know that he suffered a little bit with injury. He played the 16 games and kicked 20 goals. I do think he's capable of a better ratio than that for a start. Obviously, he's playing in a struggling team, so that's not the best measure of him by itself. But nonetheless, he's an important player for them as that sort of dynamic forward half player. Jaden Stevenson was their second leading goal kicker this year. There's a big gap between Larky, then there's Stevenson with 26, and then there's Zerha for 20. So a variety of options in the forward line was a problem for North Melbourne in 2024. And I do think they have enough medium forwards on the list. I think it's time for Zerha to probably bump that output a little bit. And again, from a personal point of view, he is also out of contract this year. Potentially going to be a restricted free agent, I would have thought, if they don't sign him up quick. So from his point of view, he needs to play well. But also, I just think with North's dynamic and his potential, this looms as a big year for Cam Zerha and the North Melbourne Footy Club. Now, the final one I want to talk about is probably a little bit left field in comparison to some of the ones I've talked about already. But I'm going to say Joel Hamling. And I think he just really looms as an important player for the Sydney Swans this year. So from a personal point of view, he has played six games in three years and he's on a one-year deal, if I'm not mistaken. He's 31. He will turn 31 in April of this year, if I'm not mistaken. So from a personal point of view, you have the obvious need for him who's just relocated to Sydney. He probably wants to be there for more than one season. So the need for him to play well for the sake of his own contract is obvious. But I do think as well, he's really important for Sydney's structure. This is one part of the ground where the Swans, who are a very strong team going into next year, I don't think it's completely sound, for lack of a better word. You know, we're probably looking at the two starting KPDs as McCartan and Hamling. Excuse my ignorance if there's somebody more obvious than that. I realize Melican's in that mix, but I think Hamling is going to be playing in this team. And we saw what they were like a little bit with a decimated backline last year, and he's obviously coming in to plug a hole. So Sydney, I think should be considered legitimate contenders this year. And I'd say legitimate contenders is probably in the top four. That should absolutely be in their sights this year. And I think to achieve what they did with a combination of, you know, maybe a lack of fitness, some injuries last year to finish eighth was actually a fairly solid effort in the end. You factor in a potentially a healthier run, perhaps getting these players back into fitness. I think Sydney will make a run at it. And that's why Joel Hamling is going to be an important player for them, in my opinion. To be honest, I did expect the Swans to go a little bit harder at a genuine key position defender to fit their best 22. They've taken a punt on Joel Hamling, but I do think there is some degree of pressure on this particular move. I think him playing well is going to be very important for the Sydney Swans. That is my logic. All right, guys, that is my take on 10 players who I think need a big year for a variety of different reasons. Obviously, it is a pretty broad concept of a video, so you can naturally let me know in the comments who else you think needs a big 2024. But we're getting close, guys. It's getting exciting. I am uh, going to increase the volume of preseason content as we get a little bit closer to mid-Feb. I think that's when it kicks off, maybe a little bit earlier than that. But for now, I hope you're enjoying the content. I hope you're subscribed to the channel, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.